It's great to be with you all this morning in this capacity. If you don't know, my name is Dylan Coyle. I get the privilege of serving as the worship and outreach director here at Covenant. And this is a really special day for me in particular. I mean, most of what I get to do is usually right here, standing where Hannah was, playing guitar and leading in music. And every now and then I get the privilege of teaching God's word. But today is just a little bit different. I get the opportunity to step into this outreach position a bit and for us to take a day to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to be going through our series in Colossians as we have the last month over the next couple of months, but today we're going to stop and talk about, again, something a little bit different. You may not know this, but May is National Foster Care Month. And so today, we want to take some time to talk about this important reality for so many children. Let me first admit that before I stepped into this outreach position here at our church, I really didn't know anything about foster care. I certainly didn't know about the systems that were in place for children and families that found themselves in a position where they needed to take advantage of those for various reasons. Honestly, I'm ashamed to say that it wasn't on my radar at all. And I say that because it should have been. And today, I'm certainly no expert. Let me tell you that at the forefront. I've spent the last four weeks trying to understand this so I can present it to us in some way that makes sense and represents it well. But I do want to give you some facts to kind of share the state of foster care here in the United States. All right. You ready for this? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me share some things with you. There are over 391 thousand children and youth in the foster care system here in the United States. I want to put that in perspective for you. The state of Wyoming holds 580,000 people. That should give you an idea of where this really is. On average, a a child enters into foster care every 150 seconds here in the United States. Up to 80% of children in foster care suffer from a mental health condition. Children from newborn to 21 years old are in need of foster parents. This one really hit me when I read it. Roughly 40% of all households who begin the foster care process will quit just one year after starting because there's not enough support for them. And then when siblings are placed in foster care, they're not always placed into a foster home together. Imagine what that would be like. You've already been separated from some of your family, and now you have to go through that process again. Foster children often often experience multiple placements throughout their journey through the foster care system. So that means they have to go through that process again, where they're leaving people that they love behind, trying to adjust to a new home and new family, and then have to do that time and time again. And to make it even more close to home, here in the state of Ohio, there's roughly 16,000 children and youth in the foster care system here, with around seven to 8,000 families that are actively fostering those children. So as you can see, there is a need here, church, a need that many of us have been unaware of, as I said, myself included. There are children throughout the country that have no home or family to love them. There are families who are stepping in the gap to provide the love and care that these children need, but they don't feel adequately supported to endure and persevere through the unique challenges that fostering presents. And all of this is happening inside a system that is significantly overburdened because there's not enough people that are willing to jump in and help. This morning, we've got an opportunity for us to hear more about this system, for us to learn more about what it would mean for us as a church to step in the gap a bit and serve foster children and families in a way that actually makes a difference. We've got an opportunity here from an organization called Fostering Love. Fostering Love is a local organization that serves foster families, again, in a way that truly makes a difference. And I could tell you about them all day long. But it'd be a lot better to hear from them, right? All right, so why don't, we, why don't you join me in welcoming Rachel Hartzler as she comes to the stage. We're going to hear a little bit more about their mission here this morning. How's it going? Good. Good, good. Thanks for making the time to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. 
This is really cool because we get to chat about what this organization is actively doing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what's brought you guys to this place where you're serving this in this capacity and, and talk about what you're doing to serve these families and maybe how we can start to get involved if we feel the desire or the tug from God to do so. So but could you first just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how, you, how this all came to be? Is this something that God put on your heart? always knew we would adopt at some point one of our one of our kiddos and we always envisioned private adoption um, but then when our eyes were kind of open to foster care I mean to give you empathy I was completely ignorant to the whole picture myself um, until we started going through the process to get licensed and so our eyes were kind of open to that world and felt we felt God was telling us that that was kind of the way that we needed to go whether it ended in an adoption we were hopeful at some point it would but um, more like how can we enter into the picture of foster care and being able to advocate for both child and parent. Um, and so we started going through the process and a lot of those statistics that you just shared uh, were coming up in our classes. And it was just getting to the point where I just felt like I couldn't ignore it anymore. It's like mm. ignorance is bliss. If you don't know the problem and the issue at hand, you don't have to do anything about it, right? Um, and just as we were hearing more and more things, like in particular the, that the fact that 40% of people quit after a year because they don't have support was just a huge like red flag for me. It's like, well, if there's this many kids in foster care and half the people that are trying to get their license are quitting because they don't have support, like that feels like a problem. And mm -hmm. um, so at the time it was just, I just felt God just kept, tugging me to like, hey, I, I didn't just pull you into this story. I want you to bring other people with you. Um, and so I talked with my pastor at the time. We approached the agency director and just kind of said, you know, is there a support group here for your foster parents? Um, in Franklin County, they work with private agencies to, to license families, so you can't get licensed through the county. Um, and so we talked to our private agency. She's like, you know what, we've been trying to figure something like that out, but Social workers also are, you know, the turnover rate's like 30%, and they're overworked and underpaid, and she's like, we just don't have the time to do it, so whatever you guys want to do, just come do it. And we were kind of like, well, okay, I mean, <laughs> we weren't yet foster parents, so I didn't really know what people needed, and I was a parent, so I could kind of guess, but <laughs> um, so we just decided to start with a, a monthly dinner, um, and this was uh, our life group, uh, just there was like 15 of us, like, I'm like, I, th I think we need to, to enter into this. Um, and so we did, we catered Olive Garden, and there was like over 50 people that came, and just, we started doing those monthly to just get to know the parents and the families, and, and like, kind of what, what would you guys need to feel supported, and um, just started developing relationships with them as we, as we served them, and um, yeah, it just kind of started out as a way for our life group to to serve foster families because it felt like that was what God was, was asking for us to do. Man, that's so cool. I mean, just to, to start in what you were calling a missional community, which I had not heard that term before, which you helped me understand, this was a small group inside of your church, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you guys felt the burden to serve people in real ways. And this idea of fostering came to be, and it was kind of like your group was kind of, of one like mine, is that right? Mm -hmm. And so you jumped in to try to figure out how can we serve, and so, it's just so cool to hear that in a small group, God got a hold of these people's hearts and wanted to do something incredible. They, it wasn't like waiting for someone to come and start an initiative or start a program. It was just, no, we want to serve these people and jump in. And I think that's incredible to see where God has brought you guys now. So I, it sounds like your mission is to foster love, to foster care. I saw that on your website, which I love. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? Yeah. Um, when we first started, um, we didn't intend to be an organization like Dylan said we were just a small group that wanted to serve um, and so initially when we came up with that the agency had asked us well what do you want us to call you uh, so when we tell families to come to your events and it, some guy in our group was like what about fostering love and it was like okay and it just kind of <laughs> stuck and there was never really any true meaning <laughs> behind it and it was similar for this mission it was like oh foster love to foster care that sounds like so catchy and um, so that's kind of what we went with, and as, you know, we got further into it and started to do more serving and getting to know the families, God really, 
just kind of brought that full circle for me in the sense of like, when you look at the system, it feels sometimes so big and so messy that it's like, I, like you almost feel paralyzed. Like, hmm. I, I feel like I should do something, but it feels too big. Like, I don't know what to do. So, um, and God just kind of brought my heart to the point of showing me like, I'm not afraid of brokenness. I'm not afraid of you know, messiness, and I rescue you with my love in the brokenness. And mm. so God comes to us in our brokenness, in our mess, enters into it, and the antidote to all of it is his love for us. Yeah. And yeah. Um, with foster care, it's the same thing. There's, there's so much research behind trauma and how it impacts the brain. And so you can see, like, pictures of kids, you know, brains who have been in foster care versus not, and you see that there's like structural differences because trauma is, it, it affects the growth in your brain. And um, then on the flip side to that, there's also a ton of research that shows that the antidote to that trauma sorry, it's okay. is love. And so, sorry. Um, what could it look like to have people who could carry God's heart in that and show up in the mess and the brokenness and just foster love, whatever that looks like. If that's a respite night or just making a meal for a family or bringing them a coffee or taking their kids to a visit because they can't get off work or whatever that looks like, um, God just kind of showed my heart like fostering love is just showing up in people's mess and you don't have to solve the problem. I, I tend to want to like, let's just fix it all. And it's just, no, you just got to show up right? Like we know God's relational and we move at the pace of relationships. And um, if we're willing to just show up and show God's love just the way he does for us, then, you know, that's really the point to all of it is, is foster love. Man, that's so good. So good. Thanks for unpacking that. that that's huge. I, I like what you said about we always feel like we need to fix the problem, but a lot of times it's just us coming to support people when they need it. When you see a need, go meet it. You may not be able to solve everything, but you can do something. And that's beautiful. And so, I mean, your organization is, which was not supposed to be in an organization, which I find so funny. <laughs> but seven years now, you guys have been serving, serving foster families and children. What started is just some meals and um, putting on a monthly dinner. Didn't quite know what you were doing. It's grown so much. Can you tell us a bit about what Fostering Love is doing today? How's the ministry grown to what it's doing today. Yeah, we still don't know what we're doing That's in a fair. lot of ways. That's fair. <laughs> um, but really, it's just, I was telling Dylan when we talked the other day, it's people hear the story, and they feel the burden, and they want to respond in the same way that our group did. And so what started out as just a small group wanting to show up um, started catching fire. And so we had, uh, you know, a few months into it, another agency reached out to me, and they're like, well, how do we partner with Fostering Love? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, we're not even like a thing. And, and so then I felt like God started stirring my heart again. Like, hey, I, this is not just for one agency. This is bigger than just you and your group. Like, I'm going to grow this thing and I will bring you the people. So I was like, all right, well then bring the people. And it was not two weeks later, there was another group at our church about to launch a missional community. And the leader approached me. He's like, hey, we love what you're doing can we do something like what you're doing? And I was like, actually, yes, there's an agency that's interested. And so it's really just unfolded like that. It's been very effortless. I haven't had to do anything but, but share my heart and the vision that God has given us. And people hear it and they respond. And it's like God's just faithful in, in bringing people and bringing uh, churches and businesses that want to partner and help us and um, so it really just started with telling the story. And now we're in, I think, seven counties. Um, and we have three partnerships right here just in Franklin County. At uh, They have 16 agencies here. And so we're at three of those 16. Um, and then in, you know, six other counties, which, again, it's like, wow, this is, okay, God, you're doing something. And, and I think just reminding me, too, like, this doesn't boil down to just one person. It's not, you know, Rachel's in all these counties doing all the things. It's 
he's saying like, no, I will bring you the people, train them, show them the vision, and then let that vision catch fire. And I always tell my, my leaders, if, we're, if we look the same, then we're doing something wrong because we're serving different agencies and different families with different kiddos who have different needs. And you know, God has people that are ready to serve who also have different giftings and callings. And so the way that we serve and the way that we look is different everywhere. And we do have some structure in the sense of when we first started, it was like, well, I guess we should probably you know, come up with something organizational uh, <laughs> to make us look somewhat official. And so it's, we often say it's high accountability, but very low control. There are you know, a few things we hold you accountable to as a fostering love partner is what we call our little chapters. Um, but then from there, it's just kind of like, let the Holy Spirit work let him pull to the surface the things that, you know, uh, could meet needs here for the families and just get to know your families. We should be in relationship and that's the total goal of this is just um, letting God move and letting God bring the people in the churches and, and um, showing them how to meet the needs that are right in front of them. I love how much you talk about relationship and that seems to be like the key piece of your heartbeat for this organization. Uh, you even mentioned you move at the pace of relationships, which I think is a really cool way to say it. I imagine since that is the key piece that you've been able to build a lot of relationships with a lot of people and probably seen God do some incredible things through your ministry. As you look over the last seven years so far, can you share maybe one of the most impactful situations or stories that you've been a part of? Yeah, this one was a hard one for me when I was thinking through it because... Um, you know, it's like we, we do a back to school bash and we do Christmas parties and we do a Friendsgiving and things like that. And it was like, there was something in me that was like, oh, I gotta find like the biggest, best event that we did and share about that. But I think really the, the most impactful things are the small things. It's the, you know, the families that message us after our back to school bash and say like, you have no idea, you just saved me like hundreds of dollars in school supplies just because, you know, they have so many kids and it's, expensive to buy school supplies and backpacks and and so it's like you know when you start to feel like that pressure of we've got to solve this whole problem it's such a mess and are, you know are we really doing anything does this really matter and then you you hear these things like I saved so much money like my kids got to come to your respite night and just feel like a kid mm -hmm. and be you know there wasn't like a differentiation between like oh you're the foster and you're the biological it was just they were just kids having fun and we had a family show up to one of our respite nights, I think about a year ago, and they were like, they have eight kids between their foster kids and their biological kids. And she was like, came back like almost in tears, just like, we haven't had a date night in over two years. We were just like, what? Oh my gosh. So, you know, just the little things like that where you're like, okay, like this, this matters. And it's, it's the little, you know, things that move you forward and it's just like yeah just people just show like it's not hard for us to pull off a respite night we just feed kids and play with kids for a couple hours right. and but to this couple it was like oh my gosh we haven't just got to do that without eight you know there's not a lot of people that would watch eight children yeah. <laughs> so you know I would say the most impactful things are those little things that for that family or that couple or that you know child it's like that was a big thing, you yeah. know, to us, it feels like, what well, it didn't really, you know, cost me much, right. but like, man, yeah, we got to give you a date night for the first time in two years. Yeah, that's huge. So cool. So cool. So I imagine it, it takes quite a bit to run this organization and do it well. One of the things that you guys do to raise funds is the Hartzler's ice cream truck, right? That we've got here today, which I hope you're excited about. <laughs> ice cream at church. Amen. Yeah, right. Ice cream for breakfast. Kids are pumped. I know they are. I've tried to Sorry, tell every parents. single kid in front of their parents about this ice cream truck <laughs> to force all of you to go out there. But um, that being said, uh, it sounds like this is a big part of raising funds for your ministry. Can you tell us a little bit about how these proceeds are going to go to support Fostering Love? So we, um, Fostering Love, will purchase ice cream from the dairy at cost. They don't make any money on us, which is very generous. And then um, we just take it around. I think we had 12 events this month just for National Foster Care Month. Um, just park at churches who are willing to have us. And we sell uh, bowls of ice cream. They're $5. And then we have our single-serve milks that are $4. And every ounce, um, proceeds, tips, all of it goes back to Fostering Love. 
um, to use for things like respite night or our back to school bash is coming up in August and we have, you know, now we're in six counties. So there's several back to school bashes that, you know, we send every kid foster and biological K through 12 home with a backpack and a target gift card. So, um, you know, this is what we use our funds for. We don't have employees. We don't, nobody's paid to do what we do. It's all volunteer run. So we're very proud of the fact that we give away 100% of, of what is brought in and it all mm. goes directly to the agencies, the families and the kiddos. Um, March is National Social Worker Month. So we usually do, whether it's a dinner or a gift or something for our social workers just to, you know, they're, they're working double time on this kind of stuff. And so we want them to feel supported and appreciated. And so, yeah, the funds go to, yeah, the things like the respite nights, family parties. Um, we also do individual needs. Like if families reach out and they're like, you know, we're getting a placement. We, we don't have a crib. We can't find a crib. It's like, well, we'll buy you a crib. Yeah. Um, there was a kiddo that uh, the insurance wouldn't cover his new glasses. So we paid $200 for him to get new glasses. And like the family's like, oh my gosh, you know, that didn't have to come yeah. out of our pockets. So that's what um, our money goes to. That's great. And so let's just say that there's some strange person out here that doesn't like ice cream. Um, yeah, that'd be weird. But if that was to happen, can they still give to the organization today? Yes, yes. Okay. We will welcome any donation. Yes, even if you're one of the, the weird ones that won't eat ice cream. But yes. Awesome. There are dairy free right. people. I do get that. So yes, yeah. but we will take any That's donation. Not us. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, let's give Rachel another round of applause. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, guys. We'll see you out there after service. All right. So here's the question, guys. Why, why are we doing this today? Why are we partnering with Fostering Love? Why are we talking about this topic. Well, the, the first thing is I hope you understand there is a need here. There's a very real opportunity for us as the church, as the body, to step in and do something for foster families, for parents, for children. There's a very obvious need that we can do something about. Not everyone can foster children. We get that. That's obvious. But everyone can do something to make some kind of change. But there's two more reasons why we're taking time to highlight this this morning. And this is where we're going to take some notes if you're following along. I've got a couple points for you. The first one is this work reflects God's heart. Point number one, this work reflects God's heart. See, it's impossible to read through Scripture and not see God's desire to protect and defend and to provide and care for orphans and for the fatherless and those who are less fortunate in the world and can't solely take care of themselves. See, in the New and Old Testament, you see a consistent thread that God promises to do just that. And we could go through so many passages this morning to really highlight this. One of my favorites is Psalm 68.5 simply says, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Father of the fatherless. See, this passage says that God is the father to the fatherless, that he cares for those who have lost their fathers and he will take on that role in their lives. And with that understanding, we see how God calls us to reflect himself in the way that he instructs us to do the same. James 1.27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions. Now, as you read through this particular verse, you study the word orphans, you can see that this is not simply referring to foster children, right? This is for those that are in need in society, but it's impossible to exclude them, right? I mean, James is saying that as followers of Christ, as people who have experienced the love of God the Father, we get to show that in an outward expression by caring for those that need it. As you read through the book of James, you see this constant thread which just a few verses before he gives this reality is that we should not just simply be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. And then found among the three major ways that he urges us to live this out is to care 
for the orphans and widows, those that are in need. These are two of the most vulnerable positions in society at that time. See, when believers see someone in need, our response should be to extend love and to seek to help and care for them as they need it and we're able to provide it. Trust me, I'm not the greatest example of this by any means. But as I took time and space to hear about and read the stories of these children, these families, inside of this system, it was impossible not to feel like I wanted to do something to help. As I heard about placement after placement for particular children as they're taken from family to the next, as they go through the hardships that they're a part of. As I met with families inside of our church that are fostering children or have in the past, one, I couldn't help but catch a bit of their passion, that they're willing to step in and do something that's hard work, but to hear that they don't feel supported hurts. To feel that parents that are willing to open up their home to children that don't have a family and then don't feel supported to love those children well is a big miss in the church. And so for me, my heart started to well up. I don't know what all the answers are, but I knew we got to do something. And see, the beauty in all of this is that we have the opportunity to live out what God has done for us. And so point number two, this is what God has done for us. I know it's so simple, that this is what God has done for us. I'm going to read Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 13. Follow along with me. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. That we, that are in Christ, are children of God. See, how often do we address God, church? How often, with what title do we speak to him with or speak of him with? We use the term father, right? We don't use that word just simply because it's something we dreamed up to call God. No, in, a, in many ways, it's the ways that God has revealed himself to us. Have you ever really considered, and I mean deeply, what it means to call God Father? We were separated from him. And he stepped in and brought us home. Does that sound familiar? We were strangers in our sin, and yet God came and welcomed us into the family. We were in need, and he does and has and will supply in his perfect timing every time. And now we have the opportunity to reflect God's heart to others, to love them as we've been loved by God and to support them as we've been supported by our Father. And so the question is, what can we do? Listen, it's, again, unrealistic to think that everyone in this room could foster a child. I get that. But what I heard from every single family, and as I met with Rachel and some other people, what I found is that that's not the expectation. Right? Rachel even talked about how the, the job here is not to jump in and solve every single problem. It's just to be present and to do something. There's not a person in this room or Anyone that calls this church their home that doesn't have something they can offer to these families. And so I want to give you just a quick few things to help you understand what you can do. The first is to pray. It may sound so simple, but as I met with family after family, they shared how important it is to know that you, our church body, are praying for them, supporting them, lifting them up, 
One family said, yeah, it's, it's impossible to not see the physical needs that we have and the physical things we're trying to do to meet these child's needs, but there's a spiritual battle that's taking place. They said, when these children come into our home, as much as we love them and want to care for them, they've got a tough past a lot of the time. And so we should be covering them in prayer. We should be going before God, defending them, fighting for them as we speak to the Lord to empower these parents to make a difference for these, a difference for these children. Asking the Lord to get a hold of their hearts. We can do that. It takes no talent. It takes no special skill. It just takes being willing to get involved. Number two is you can get informed. We wanted to make some resources available to you, and we've done that. There's just a few so far. If you go to the website, covenantchurch.us forward slash fostering day, you'll see some resources there. Or you can find them in the Covenant Church app if you hit the fostering day image. It's going to bring you to a page that gives you some resources. All three of these do different things. First, you can learn about fostering love, learn more about the organization. Two, there's a government website for here in Ohio where you can learn all about what it takes to become a foster parent. You can learn more about the system. You can learn about the requirements and the process to go through to make yourself available in that way. And the third is a site called the Archibald Project. It's specifically designed to give you the stories of these children that have been changed by families that have stepped in and made a difference. So if you just want to hear about what God has done in these children's lives, jump over to that website and learn some more. Also on that site, you're going to find a form at the bottom. This is for anybody that wants to connect with a foster family here in our church to learn more about how they can be serving them, to learn more about what it was like for them to get involved, to learn more about their stories. What blew my mind when I met with these families is every single one said that they didn't know about the other foster families here in our church. I couldn't believe it. I met with at least five. And so we want to get a community together. We want people that are walking through these things to know that they're doing it together and that their church body is here to support them in many ways. And the last thing is here we can get involved. And so I want you to know this is not just a day. I know it's called Fostering Day, but that's not what this is. This is the first step into a journey of learning how we as a church can make a difference. There's going to be some opportunities that are going to come up as we speak more with Rachel and fostering love and we learn more about what the needs are. We're going to figure out how you and I can get involved. It's going to be things like cooking and delivering meals when there's new placements to families. It's going to be things like providing supplies like clothing and cribs and furniture and all those things that families need when a new placement is matched with them. There's opportunities like service, like go and mow a lawn for a foster family. They're pretty busy. Rachel talked about there are families that are fostering like eight to ten children. They don't have time to go mow their lawn. Maybe it's cleaning. Whatever it is, just go step in and serve if you've got those gifts. There'll be opportunities like respite nights. She talked about those monthly dinners where they invite the whole family. There's no distinction between foster child and biological child. They all come in and have fun, and the parents go and have a meal and are served as well. We're going to get a chance to do things like that. Maybe it's going through the process of becoming a licensed babysitter so you can give foster parents a chance to go out on a date. It's far too common. I've heard that over and over again. It's been years since we've had a date. That's something a lot of us take for granted. Maybe you need to learn about that process. And the last thing will be things like community. Grab coffee with a foster parent in our church. Listen to them. Encourage them. Help them to know that you're there, that you're in it with them. That's the number one thing I heard. They just want someone to be there with them. And so the list will come together in time. But my hope is that this morning you've had a chance to see that there's a need, and this is important, and every single one of us is equipped to do something to make a difference. That form that I mentioned earlier is also a really great way for you to let us know if there's a certain way you want to meet a need. 
And so feel free to share in that. And I will personally get you matched up with a family here in our church that is fostering now and is in need. All right? Let's pray, church. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this this morning. Thank you for letting us see into your heart. Man, I really hope that we've seen our story in some way this morning. Many of us in this very room, maybe we didn't go through the foster care system, but we literally were fatherless. And you proved that you are father to those that don't have one. And maybe we had incredible parents. I don't know. Maybe life growing up wasn't so tough and challenging. But there was still the massive barrier of our sin that kept us from you. And you and your incredible love for us stepped in and brought us home. You gave us family. You gave us a place to belong inside of your body. And so I just pray that we would use that as fuel to make a difference in these children and parents' lives. That you'd show us as a church what we can be doing to step in the gap. That we wouldn't be too afraid because it can be broken and messy, that it can be challenging. Just pray, Lord, that you give us a supernatural desire to do something. And there's probably hearts that you're stirring right now to learn more about what it would take to become a foster parent. I pray that you would cultivate in their hearts the ability to hear what you desire and to walk out in boldness and faith, believing that you'll do what you've called them to, that you'll equip them for every single thing that would be a part of that journey. It's probably people in here right now that have companies that do things that they normally are hired for but would be willing to provide services for free for these families. I pray that you would continue to fan that flame. Or maybe it's just people in here that are good at giving a listening ear, are gifted and encouraging and supporting people. I pray that you'd put people on their hearts right now, Lord that they can spend time with and encourage. We're excited about what you're going to do through this church, Lord. In an area that needs so much help, trusting and believing for great things, and that you'll guide us to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.